The big baldy with spectacled bollocks. Nudes you'll never see on well-draped statuettes or hear one word that can't be disproved by default. Forgive me, forgive me, father, for I'm about to become your son. Just don't tell me, mummy. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the BBBB, not the BBG, not the BBC, not even the BB King or the BB Bridget Bardot. I just BBBB, the one and only myself. And like the BBG, Mr. Richie Allen himself, I'll BBBB taking the sole credit for that. And I'll BBBB sure to put it on the very top of my resume. Flattery is usually the worst form of impersonation. And I'd apologise for the phony Irish accent, but the, the BBG himself is very apt to affect accents. He knows he can't do for shite, no more than perform a Mexican hat dance on a baseball cap while wielding a cricket bat and juggling three soccer balls at the same time. But, but if it seems apropos, and of the sheer delightedness and all, just for the crack of it, he's, he's willing to give it a fly. And, and should any melting snowflake take offence, the BBG free to report him to the APAL, the anti phony accent league. Let him try to have him done up for stereotyping hate crime when he's just being his merely mortal, all too human, independent, freely speaking, freely thinking self and all, not a disrespectful racist bone in his body. And I believe him and I'll. He very often affects a Yorkshire accent, and, and being a Yorkshireman, sure, I didn't take any offence at all at all. And I don't say this often. Well, maybe I do. Maybe I do say it often. Maybe, maybe I do. I say it a lot. Maybe I say it a lot more than I, I think, more than I realise. But, but if I do, if I do say it a lot more than I realise, you need to realise I must really mean it a lot. Because I will not be bullshitting you. I will not be bullshitting anybody, least of all myself. I'd just be shoveling bullshit back into my own mental housing estate, stinking up my own self-respect and probing integrity, trapped wallowing in my own bullshit all my life, which is one definition of commercial radio. I shoveled up enough bullshit there when I was, I was building a career, not a life. Part of the job description in any mainstream media, withholding so much of your livelier thoughts and opinions, too often asking questions you know you'll get no real or even a wrong answer for, but it's your job to make it sound all right, all right. I was leaving too much of myself at home. So now I'm at home, unabridged, unredacted, with no accountability except to myself. And any guests I choose to invite into my home, all the men and women who've informed and fascinated me with their unabridged, unredacted thoughts and opinions, storied interpretations of how and why this world got to be as it is, or as it seems to be as it is. Experts from their own chosen field in which they feel perfectly at home. I, I didn't invest all this sweat equity to feed on muppet puppet platitudes and bullshit placebos. I, I may have to gift at a gab, but I'll chew on my own bollocks if I ever start sounding glib. I don't want to leave one cliché-ridden bone in my body untouched and contaminating my human natural. We can agree to agree or agree to disagree, though. As an interviewer, I'm always inclined to find something I disagree with because I'm a big fan of a good, agreeably unagreeable argument, more likely to enlighten the world with its multiplicity, multiplicity of disagreements debated on disagreeably. Unfortunately, so many of the people I truly disagree with decline me invitations, but I do live in hope they might eventually see the value of disagreeing agreeably and the world will be a better place for it. I don't want anybody apologising for what they think. I just reserve the right to disagree with them and thereby hangs a lively chat show. Unfortunately, my special guest this afternoon severely overslept, so in the immortal words of Peter Pan, I shall fly alone to never, never land if I have to, oh ye, of little faith in your own pyjamas and humanity's capacity to improvise on the wings of defying dead air. So where the fuck was I? I was looking for the truth. 
Or was I just looking for a lively chat show? But it's not about me. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's a lot more about me than I like to think it is. But if it is, I'm just another fellow traveller on my own self-inflicted journey to enlightenment or otherwise. I've always considered myself a decent bloke. A regular guy, as the Yanks would say, just a big, baldy, bespectacled bollocks of an Irish paddy of a dream pipe sluice, as I would say, trying to separate the sewage from the crystal spring water. A trained journalist gone rogue and resolutely independent, no auto cued virtue signalling snowflake who'd cover up their own trigger warning just before they shoot you point blank in the front of your back. Inversions being a well chosen tactic of the truly great deceivers. He's not a truth warrior. Anybody calls him that, he's liable to punch him in the nose, make truth more complicated than they ever fucking dreamed it was. If I have to tell somebody they're lying, they must be a better liar than they thought if they don't even know it themselves, and why would they believe me? If I can convince you I know the truth better than you do, maybe you're a worse liar than you need to be. I've never had somebody tell me I'm lying. Because I never tell anybody I know what the truth is. with a big T T T two T's in a coffee. I just looked at the evidence and formed a credible opinion. Sometimes it seems plain as day. Sometimes as murky as being three sheets to the galloping wind and just as volatile. But if somebody rips me toenails off, tosses acid in me face, sticks a red-hot poker up me rear end and tells me it was an accident, why would I not think they were lying? Of course, he would never really punch anybody in the nose. Just for calling him names, he's been called a lot worse things than Truth Warrior. Just rolls off his back, sticks and stones, 1066 and Oliver Cromwell and all that. So I, I like this guy. I, I, really, I really enjoy and appreciate this guy. He makes me laugh. He makes me think. Revives my faith in humanity, coming to me even over the global air waved into webbings. I, I endorse this guy, and you know me. You know me. I rarely endorse anything or anybody. Well, maybe I do. Maybe I do endorse quite a few bits of anything at somebody more than I realize. But, but if I do, you need to realize I really mean it. And I'm not just blowing powder puffs up anything or anybody's rear end, because I will not be bullshitting you. I will not be bullshitting anybody, least of all myself. I'd just be shoveling bullshit, but, but haven't I done this already? Or was that the same thing about something else altogether? Jesus, I've lost me bullet points. I am neither big nor bald, nor bespectacled, nor Irish, but as liable as Mr. Allen is himself to behave like a bit of a bollocks. Just comes with the briar patch of being alive and human and not always full of the joys of a spring mattress. And any flippancy, flubs, faux pas, or foul mouthry only serves to highlight his sincerity. When he does come apropos any matters of the deepest heartfelt or appreciation for somebody else's expertise or sheer fucking genius of insight, his own mental evolution's palpable. Oh, it's not about him. He reiterates frequently. He's just, he's just a conduit for the free flow of information you're unlikely to come across on the mainstream media. It flows through him freely, though I do consider he either consciously or unconsciously, modestly or just journalistically committedly underestimates and unvalues the value of a particular presence to keep the flow buoyantly abreast of listenability. To advocate free speech, you need to be heard speaking freely, not just informally, for my ears anyway. I was once told that Zen masters would every now and then whack their students with a big stick when they were least expecting it, maybe, maybe to bring them back down to earth, their minds too far gone in the empty spaces of nothingness or too much self-deference to a living pedestal, maybe Maybe an outbreak of utter foul mothery serves the same purpose. I mean, I've, I've been to many a dull community theatre performance. The, the audience all but politely as best dozing off. Suddenly rouse reanimate when one of the actors apparently out of nowhere utters a swear word. Fuck, shit. A great awakening. 
Doesn't take much with a less than cosmopolitan crowd. A few coy gasps and titters, especially if it's been uttered by the Alzheimer granny in apron and fluffy slippers. I mean, they'd be watching Netflix if they expected that sort of language. It's all about balance. Balancing something with nothing into a well-being everything. I've been told a few times, I think too much, you're thinking too much, you have to try not to think too much. I've never been much of a meditator. I think the closest I've come to thinking nothing is after a few points in the pub watching a football game on the telly. England at least making the last 16 of the World Cup because he may be Irish, but I live in England and I've always had a soft spot for the underdogs. I was out... I was out jogging the other day with my dog. I forget his name for the moment, but he's a chirpy little fella. Suddenly, this terribly unchirpy fella starts screaming bloody murder in my face for no reason I could think of. He was walking his dog. Maybe maybe I'd interrupted their meditation together, rudely dragged him out of his zen zone. He did piss me off, and for a moment there he came close to whacking him with a big stick to disarm his lack of mastery of himself, but, but I didn't, I did not. I just kept jogging on, left him screaming bloody murder to the wind of a world that had obviously robbed him of any peace of his mind he had left, a world that didn't give a flying fuck about his mental derangements. He needed to get something out of his system, and, and I did feel bad. I did feel bad I couldn't help him at all. I was told later he was a local loony, Best to just ignore it, but I couldn't help thinking that was no solution at all. I read somewhere that meditation is like a catalytic converter, soaks up all the negative energies and reinvigorates them positively. Sometimes you have to go comatose to get a fresh perspective on life. When, when all the wheels have come off your trolley, all your baggage piled on top can't budge it neither this way nor that, and your fucking plane's leaving in five minutes. Since a very young age, I've been learning how to cherish those most beautifully riveting, mind-blowing moments when somebody says something I've, I've simply never heard before, so hauntingly compelling. It changes my life, changes my mind, shifts my perspective, moves my horizon, opens up time and space. You suddenly have no doubt there are things you can never think the same again, only to reflect on your previous naivety to what should have been so obvious. It's the opposite of light entertainment. Another dimension, a truly dramatic moment without the conflict, without the staging, a shape-shifting, but not of the body, of the consciousness. An awakening, if, awakening if not to the truth with the big TT, two T's in the coffee, but the shredding of a lie, the shedding of a lie. A stargate is opening up in your mind. And you know you're on your way to new possibilities in your relationship to this world, this life. And for a time that can rule your perspective, you simply cannot believe anybody or anything could take you further, deeper, but, but it's the antithesis of being buried. It's a, a resurrection of a dead or dying mind. And for me, more often than not, it had to be said, it had to be heard, it had to be spoken without force, without imperative, as if for the speaker it was already simply a matter of fact. They'd already had their revelation, absorbed it into their being. They almost included in passing. Only for the listener does it stop them in their tracks. They have no response. It's not awe, because somehow it's already become so obvious. If it's a shock at all, it's simply the shock of incredulity that you never thought of that before. Music can do it to me emotionally, physically, but for whatever reason, it's the words that can change my mind. An absolutely seminal insight consummated in language. Same with the visual arts, more designed for me to arouse appreciation, which too readily demands analysis, too comforting and too demanding at the same time, too definitive for its own process. Feels like it takes me out of this world and proceeds to limit it. The spoken words, words spoken, on the other hand, can disarm analysis, postpone reflection. You, you simply weren't expecting it, not waiting for it. You weren't praying for it to turn up. It just appears. It appears out of a cloud when, when you are neither anticipating sunshine nor rain, 
nor anything. You just happen to be in the right time at the right place. An organic evolution of understanding. And nobody was hurt, nobody cried, nobody laughed. There was no threat, no warning, no alarm. Nothing changed and everything changed. And you know, your relationship to the world can never be the same. It's an old song, no idea how old it, who wrote it. I, I could look it up on Google, but for the moment it doesn't seem to matter. Would it, would it matter to whoever wrote it? Would I be disrespecting him or her not to feel it matters? They probably got a whole backlog of songs to explore. Did they make a career of it, or was it just a one-off? It's a poignant ballad, a lullaby, a dirge, a eulogy, a convict on death row on his way to the gallows or the electric chair or lethal injection, asking his jailer to sing him back home, sing me back home, an old familiar melody to make his old memories come alive can bring tears to your eyes, tweak your heart to the breaking brink, but, but for me, I, can, I can't help thinking, for whatever reason, I might, I might be better move forward to my own death throes if somebody told me something I'd never heard before. Shit, bloody hell, I never thought of that before. It would give my departing spirit something to reflect on in my next phase of eternity, not just nostalgia for the previous one. It's graduation day. Now I need to relearn everything I've already learned and expand it into an ever-evolving higher consciousness. Otherwise, it may just have been a waste of good tears and laughter. One of the most, one of the most memorable moments of theater I ever saw in a little black box, intimate space, back of a North London pub, minimal, production values, lead character, a bit of a lifelong charlatan. At, at the end, he finishes up on his knees in a dimming spot, and he just keeps repeating, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. He murdered somebody and couldn't explain it, not even to himself. There's, a, there's an old movie, Cool Hand Luke, Paul, Paul Newman playing a convict on the run from a sudden chain gang. He, he can hear the hounds of hell in pursuit. He finally retreats into an old abandoned church. He knows he's surrounded at the end of his rope, his situation hopeless, fated at best to be locked up indefinitely in the hole. He distractedly looks up at this image of the Christ on the cross and simply responds in perfectly normal cursive vernacular, Jesus, and something clicks. Something clicks, it's like something's been nailed to some revelatory recognition in his mind, his body and soul. It's a bit like a confirmed atheist realising he's been ejaculating his orgasms all these years and collating it irresistibly to God. God, that was good. God, that's a relief. Suddenly realise he has no idea why the two should be so connected. It could blow your mind, man. It's just a word. But if it hadn't been spoken, at that moment of potential procreation or simple ecstasy. But, but let's, let's get back to what I wasn't saying. What I wasn't saying a lot, that I didn't realise I was saying a lot, but if I am saying it a lot, it must mean I really mean it, and it's not just bullshit. I mean, anybody put themselves out in public on a regular basis bound to start repeating themselves more than they like to think they do to get their fundamental message across because everybody's got a fundamental message to deliver and repetition a fundamental way of eking it out from the generally scatological subconscious right even the oldest jokes can still be funny. The oldest songs still comforting and reinvigorating gateway mantras to a rebalancing of the nerve endings. But if, if, if you never jump into fresh water, you're in danger of becoming a politician or a TV personality, thriving in your stagnant pond, caught in a rat trap truly baited with bullshit, forever determined to calcify a system, the bones of which are brittling all over the fucking place. Bullshit seeped into their blood veins, all patched up with professional ghost scripts and photo ops and postures of utter recognisability. Don't take, don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. Listen to the fucking British Prime Minister, fondly known as Boris, by all his loving followers, a singularly 
barely animate public school clown goon, to all apparent intents and webbers as one of the most powerful Muppet puppets on the planet, representing the will of the British people, the face of its decisions, democracy at work and play, the facade of its duly elected products, sick transit Brexit malarkying, the straw blonde mop topped hayseed baby face bozo if i have to do what i'm told to do then so do you you have to do what i'm told to tell you to do whatever the fuck it is not easy to remember these days because they change their fucking minds so often do you know how many late night committees they have to go through to reach these decisions because i don't i never get invited they just tell me later what i need to tell everybody they have to do including telling everybody else what they have to do, because if they have to do it, so does everybody else. We're either all in this together or we're not. In which case, you'll have to do it all over again and again till everybody is, whatever it is. You need to report yourself to the proper authorities. Am I, am I making myself clear? Or do I need to say all that shit again? We need, we need to lock ourselves down for our own good, go into hiding and avoidance of ourselves, cover our faces in pride, not shame, and whatever we do, don't kill your granny, just put her in a care home and we'll do it for you. These are dangerous, virulent times, and if you don't believe me, watch the BBC News, they'll tell you exactly the same fucking thing, and if you don't believe them, well... You may as well not pay your licence fee, in which, in which case you may have the cops come knocking on your door. And if you think this is a police state, wait till the fucking military comes bursting through your back channels. So, so shall we take a vote on it, or did we already do that? I believe we did. So you have nobody to blame but yourselves for listening to unlicensed wackos who wouldn't believe they had a pimple on their nose if they couldn't see it in the mirror. And it's you, I'm sure, I'm talking about you big, baldy, bespectacled bollocks of an Irish sluice. You're not going the right way up the wrong way system. You should never have posted that Twitter pic of your granny with Val Dunick and David I. Che Guevara and Simon Bolivar in the background, not to mention your periodical rants about the racist, apartheid, genocidal, war and power-mongering Zionist state of Israel that would turn the Middle East into a concentration camp, set an example for the rest of the world, how not to be holocausted, victimised anymore, and you wonder why you need to be deleted from civilised discourse, if only for your foul fucking life language and impeachable opinions about ridding the world of any fucking Zionists who don't just want to be Jewish and not a fucking robot. Maybe, maybe you just haven't met the right Jew or the right robot yet. And if, and if my dearly beloved future Mrs. A is listening to this, I'm very happily at home, sweetheart, not prowling the local Apple store all fashionably masked in search of undiseased cybernetic companionship. She knows who I am. As much as anybody knows who I am, her big, baldy, bespectacled bollocks of an Irish paddy of a drain pap, pipe who loves her to bits, humble, humble to the point of knowing it's only love can break your heart, and humiliated enough to know it's only not being able to think and speak your own thoughts and opinions can break your fucking spirit. Pharmaceuticals, vaccines, direct and indirect energy weapons can unnaturally wear down your body. Fear of everything can obliterate your soul. If the only way to keep us safe is full brain and body cam implants back of our eyeballs, so our government can always see and let us know when something really wicked our way is coming. So you need to lock all your doors and windows. Hide your granny in the closet, your mother-in-law under the sink, your wee bands in the washing machine. Sweep everything else under the carpet and wrap yourself in mouse traps and wait till we tell you it's just going and you're safe to go under the table. Now forget about the missus. She's already climbed up the wall. And you may hear a faint buzzing in your ears, but, but it's not till your brain starts beeping. You'll know that something wicked has already arrived in spite of all the mouse straps. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I feel like, I feel like we're being frozen in time. This world is being frozen in time, being put into some kind of freeze frame, one stop shopping, one screen viewing, one thought thinking, everything going so fast and not really moving at the same time because we've already been there so many times. 
We must know we never really left that same place in, in the womb at the moment of conception. But the quicker we get out of here, the sooner everything else will be over in a flash, a flash flood of knowing we were wrong. We'd, we didn't think it through. We let ourselves be fooled by so much disarming enlightenment, all that ensuing glow and glitter and sparkle and lightning flashes of somebody else's brilliance. It blinded our eyes to the real beauty, the real beauty of your mummy's smile, simply being natural, amazed by our own human nature, curious, tender, resilient, creative, thoughtful, innocent of any crime that would defile its own innocence, utterly fascinated by this life on this earth, this planet that would carry on forever if we just let it be. In its own time, no artificial deadlines. Sometimes it feels like we've created our own disease so we can spend our lives looking for a cure, looking for an answer to a, a question we didn't need to ask in the first place, but experience seems to tell us we've already lost that innocence. And there's no going back to the garden. Too many weeds grown up, too much lack of tenderness, and, and we've got nobody to blame but ourselves. So if there is a cure, if there is a cure for this disease, it'll have to come from ourselves. Go looking for somebody else to find it for you, like looking for a haystack in a needle. The biggest thrill. The biggest thrill I get on this journey, my own self-inflicted journey to enlightenment or otherwise, the biggest thrill I get is when somebody changes my mind. In one moment, one living, breathing moment, one light goes out and another light goes on and suddenly the room in my head gets so much brighter and I wonder why I hadn't just switched it on for myself in the first place. Somebody else had to do it for me. Show me. Show me where the switch was. And they did. And I feel, I feel so fucking grateful. So humbly and humiliatedly thankful that somebody has given me this gift. And I don't say this very often. Or maybe I do say it often. But I'm not sucking up. I'm not kissing anybody's ass. I'm not patronizing anybody at all. But, but thank you. Thank you, man, woman, whoever, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because at that moment I know, without a doubting shadow in my heart, that this world is not yet belonging to robots and psychopaths. It would be an understatement to say he was not an attractive man. This shabby, sallow, complexioned loiterer in his own skin, flesh, blood and bone, crumpled, ill-fitting ring around the collar, suit and tie, scuffed, patent leather shoes with unruly laces. It, it wouldn't have been a stretch to think he had holes in his socks and stains on his underwear. He turned up at this theatre workshop a few weeks before, spoke to nobody other than the monthly facilitator, and this week he turned up with a script under his arm for a cold reading by the actors as an audition for membership. Politely liberal politess let it drone on for almost an hour. A, a more humorless, cliché-ridden, dramatically vacant sub-soap opera ensued to an abrupt no-ending. The actors befuddled, incredulous, wondering where the last fucking page disappeared to, but, but there was no ending. Nothing happened in the end that hadn't been happening for an interminable 50-odd minutes. The captive audience know so much dumbfounded as creatively insulted. Though liberal politess demanded, they remain in silence as the playwright took to the stage for protocol critical feedback. What was he trying to say? Who were these characters? Did any of them have any intention at all? What well, was the conflict? Where was the conflict? Where was the ending? Till finally one bold member cut to the chase. That was so fucking boring. It broke the ice. The poor playwright suddenly drowning in retroactive, retroactive insults. He flinched visibly, hitched up a trouser leg as if to expose or at least no holes in the tops of his socks. The bare white flesh seemed almost obscene. Put a final nail in his auditioning coffin. Then he, he responded, neither flippant, nor defiant, nor obsequiously apologetic. Simply matter of fact, it had to be boring, he said. It had to be boring, otherwise 
the ending wouldn't have been so terrifying. But there was no ending. Oh, I took the ending out, he said. I took out the ending. It was too terrifying. He was laughed off the stage. He left the theatre and never returned. And I never gave him a second thought till now. It's about the process, not the product. You want product, go Google yourself into a smartphone. And if you think this is a load of bullshit, bollocks, feel free to tweet me, write a reply. I'd prefer no death threats, but other than that, you can say whatever the fuck you like, because I'm a thick-skinned, big, baldy, bespectacled bollocks of an Irish paddy up between pipes loose who may sometimes sound like I'm foul-mouthed talking through my arse, but everything's connected. And if everybody could just connect their ass to their mind and their heart to their soul, maybe maybe there'd be nobody unspiritedly crapping bullshit at all. But now I think it's time for a little Billy Gates. I mean, Joel. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, you haven't been listening to the Richie Allen Show, but, but I would recommend you do, and I, you don't know me, but I rarely recommend it. Anything or any... Well, maybe I do. Maybe I do recommend somebody's a lot more than I think I do. A lot more than I realise. But if I do, you need to know. I must really mean it. Because I will not be bullshitting you. I'd just be shivelling bullshit back into my own back channels. And Jesus, Mary, and jumping Jehoshaphat's lame camel with an uncharged mobile in his hump. He is so much better at playing himself than I am. And now... A final word from my sponsor, the too late lamented, fabled, but long forgotten Irish poet. Shame on his hiney, a man with real teeth in his dentures, eyeballs in the back of his nose can smell a cavity from two cheeks apart. I shall get up and go now. I shall go to Dingley Dell. I don't know where it is now, but I think that's just as well. I shall build a little lean-to. And grow some kidney beans too. Listen to the bees go buzz. And be happy there's just one of us. I will have some peace and quiet there. When I fumigate the crickets. Some space for me feet to wander. When I've chopped down all the thickets. So I shall get up and go now. I will go jump in the lake. And dream the cream of life now. Will clot forever on me cake. And if that doesn't put dimples in your cliffs of Dover, I don't know what will, perhaps. Perhaps I don't know what will. I just know where there's a will. There must be a legacy somewhere. <laughs>